can they make a comment about canceling culture? Uh, please uh, go on. Yeah, his, just historical parallels. In cruder times, uh, canceling was accomplished by dueling and killing your um, uh, your competitors. And we have data on the number of uh, duels, and we see the uh, a great increase in the frequency of duels before crisis in the 15th, uh, 16th century, in the, 9th, in the 19th century, and so on. So today, um, you don't get uh, murdered, you just your, your reputation. Oh, I love it. The last 15 years has seen an extraordinary amount of political instability in the West. Whether it's the rise of Donald Trump in the US or Brexit here in the UK, we have seen event after event, which frankly, nobody predicted. Today's guest is Peter Turchin. He's a historian, but he's also someone with a background in applied mathematics. And he thinks that the events we've seen in recent years are merely the leading edge of something far bigger. And he knows that because he can draw on 200 plus case studies of social breakdown, civil war, and revolution. So, what we've seen in the last decade, 15 years, could that really be the beginning of something far bigger? Civil war in the United States, for instance. Huge questions, a huge book, and one hell of a guest. Peter Turchin, welcome to Downstream. Thank you. Big question to start with. Can you predict the future? I don't think so. Uh, the future is essentially unpredictable, but uh, what we can do we can uh, try to bring about a better future for us. So you can't predict the future? I don't think so. But you can have a pretty good idea about what's going to happen. You talk about these broad patterns across time and you can, you can broadly foresee highly plausible outcomes. Is that a better way of putting it? Okay, let me step back and tell you that uh, we, have, we are working on building a science of history, which we call pleodynamics. And as part of that, we have built a large database of past societies sliding into a crisis and then emerging from it. And what we found in brief is that the road to crisis seems to be quite channelized. It's like a valley with pretty uh, 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 vertical uh, uh, walls and the ball has no place to roll but down. But then once you get to the crisis, you get to a cusp and suddenly uh, a whole uh, suite of different avenues opens up to you. So when I made the prediction in 2010 about the United States experiencing crisis in 2010, we were still in that narrow valley and the ball was still rolling there. Mm. And now we are where all suite of different opportunities opens up. And, we, and I know that uh, this is a very difficult to predict, maybe even impossible. It, it may be impossible because our trajectory may depend on actions of pro-social uh, groups and leaders that can either be successful or not. If they're successful, we follow a more positive route. If they are not, uh, we can go all the way to collapse and uh, complete disaster. So the whole future is open for us. So this includes things, and we'll talk about this in a while, chaos theory, the unknowability of complex systems and whatnot. But what you're describing here right at the top is basically like when you go bowling, if you're not good at bowling, you have the, you know, the, the sides up and your ball can't go out. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a strike. So it's not inevitable where the ball is going out. But like you said, it's going to basically stay in the lane. This thing about crisis, however, and how we're on a trajectory potentially towards crisis in, in the West. I mean, in, in your book, you talk really about the United States. You, you touch upon other Policies in the West. What are the what are the trends that we see right now? Let's stick with the United States, which could mean that it's headed towards potentially things like civil war, revolution, state breakdown. What are the signs that mean that's at least plausible? Yes. Uh, so one common feature uh, of the road to crisis is the condition that we call elite overproduction. So let me explain that. Elite, who are the elites? This is the small proportion of the population who concentrate the social power in their hands. So think about the 1% United States, you know, the Mandarin class in Imperial China or military nobility in medieval England, for example. 
So the elites concentrate social power in their hands and uh, whether the societies get into trouble or not, how dysfunctional or functional they are, depends primarily on how functional the elites are. So the next question we want to ask is why do elites become periodically dysfunctional? What we see in history that even though we live in this really nice uh, complex societies which are capable of delivering high quality of life for all, right? Periodically, these systems break down. Inevitably, in the, in the past, at least, hopefully not in the future, uh, societies get into end times. So why? The elite of production is uh, the problem. Because when you have too many uh, people um, competing for too few elite positions, some competition is good, but excessive competition can be very destructive because uh, the social norms start to break down because some of the losers don't want to accept their uh, the results and they're willing to challenge the system. They become counter elites who, da who actually are the revolutionaries there, the civil warriors and so on and so forth. So can you give some examples of elite overproduction which has led to a revolution or civil war? Yes, uh, let's take uh, medieval England, if you would. So uh, in the 14th century, uh, the medieval England was ruled by essentially a military nobility. And what happened was that the Black Death came and uh, took off almost half of the population, except the most of the population affected were the peasants. All right, so uh, suddenly you had too many nobles for too few peasants to uh, to feed them and to support them. And so what happened was that England went into a century-long period, actually, of internal warfare. It was first uh, started in the 1380s. Uh, the king was disposed. There was a huge peasant rebellion, what Tyler. There was a huge uh, insurrection in Wales. So it's about the War of the Roses. Uh, at, at the no, then there was, a, there, was a, there was a quiet period, and then the war... Wars of the Roses started 50 years later. Yeah. So by the time that Wars of the Roses were over in 1485 or so, you know, uh, it's been almost a century mm. of internal um, um, instability. And so what other examples do we have of this? Obviously, because you're somebody that talks about big patterns over history. So 14th century England is one, 14th, 15th century England is one. What, what are others? Uh, essentially, as I said, um, we have gathered now uh, close to 200 cases of, uh, of past societies sliding into crisis, and um, its uh, uh, elite of reproduction is uh, essentially a universal feature of uh, the pre-crisis period. When you get too many elites uh, and they start fighting amongst themselves, so the societies become dysfunctional and they slide into crisis. So you talk about other examples in the book, for instance, um, uh, antebellum United States, pre-Civil War United States. Uh, that was actually, for me, that was probably the most interesting part of the book because juxtaposing the composition of the Southern states, what became the Confederacy with the North. You know, I didn't realize that the Confederacy had the vast majority of the ultra-rich. You know, today's oligarchs and 1% very much concentrated in the South, and yet we view the, the North as a more sort of developed capitalist state. In our heads today, those two things go side by side, but they don't have to. Another example you give um, is uh, China um, with the Taiping Civil War. This is the most sort of horrific civil war in, in, in human history. The big relevant question, the reason why you have this book out and the, people, the reason why people would be interested in it is how relevant is this to today? So are we now presently in a moment of elite overproduction? Well, uh, in, we are in the uh, United States. We are in a situation which is very similar to 1850s. Maybe let's step back and talk a little bit how elite overproduction developed in the antebellum uh, United States, and that will provide some interesting lessons for us today. So um, as you mentioned um, before the Civil War, United States was uh, ruled by uh, the elite composed of slave uh, people, people, slaveholders, and um, uh, uh, northeastern merchants who would uh, sell uh, cotton and import some goods. So two thirds of the wealth in the United States was in the Dixie, south of the Dixie uh, Mason 
uh, line. Two thirds of the wealth. Two thirds of the wealth. Wow. Yes. Uh, and then what happened was, and here we need uh, to um, invoke another important mechanism that helps to explain, for example, why elite overproduction develops. I call it the wealth pump. It's the perverse wealth pump that moves the uh, wealth from the uh, workers, from the common population to the elites. So um, the wealth pump got turned on around 1830s in the United States. Partly, this was the result of massive movement from the rural areas, which got overpopulated at that point, like the state of Connecticut, where I live, right, uh, to the cities, partly massive immigration from the overseas. And as a result of that oversupply of labor, the price of labor or the wages started declining. And so, of course, when the economy continues to grow, it, it grew quite rapidly then. But the portion that went to the workers declined. That uh, wealth had to go somewhere. It went to the economic elites. And we see suddenly there were fewer than 10 uh, millionaires around 1820. By 1850, there were over 60. So suddenly, you have this new wealth. And most of these wealthy people were in the north and northeast. And their interests uh, 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 diverged from the interests of the ruling elite uh, in a variety of ways. And so, and also they wanted to convert their wealth into political power. And so that essentially led to the crisis uh, that, turned, that turned into civil war in 1860s. So the, the sort of the, the, the basic normie reason why we have civil war in the United States, what, 1861 to 1865? Is that you know the the noble North wanted to abolish slavery? I think most reasonably informed people say, well, there's a bit more to it than that. But you're offering a really a really original it's, analysis. It was not just slavery; it was about slaveocracy. Slaveocracy. Yes. So that, please explain that. It wasn't about slavery; it was about slaveocracy. So what does that mean? Yeah. Well, it was it was about slavery too. Just slavery. Yeah. But uh, I would say that slaveocracy. So slaveocracy was this uh, the antebellum elites. And uh, because, as I said, their interests diverged from the new um, elites that made their money in mining, um, uh, uh, smelting iron and uh, railroads, right? Those um, elites wanted to have uh, infrastructure built and the uh, governing elites didn't care about it because they shipped cotton and uh, imported goods by sea and river, all right? And um, there was uh, several other uh, uh, policy uh, uh, disagreements amongst them, like the need for a bank and so on and so forth. So um, the, this uh, um, uh, the divergent interests were one of the motivations that led the new elites to try to overthrow the old elites. And they were doing this using the democratic uh, um, uh, uh, institutions, essentially. Remember that um, uh, the party of uh, Abraham Lincoln, who represented, he, in fact, he was a lawyer, he was a corporate a lawyer and uh, worked for railroads uh, most of the time about in addition to other things. So the party, this was the party of nor Northern uh, capitalists, so to speak. They came uh, to power in a legal way. And then what happened was the South, the old elites rebelled against that. They decided to separate. So that's how things led to this very bloody civil war. I love as well the way you talk about Abraham Lincoln is really funny for me because he lost more elections than he, he won. And I think you say he 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 won less than forty percent of the popular vote when he won the presidency. Thirty eight, I believe. Thirty eight percent. Yes. And so people go, Trump. You know, he he <laughs> lost the like the popular vote. Or yes. in this country, people say Farage. He keeps losing. Well, you can't on the one hand say that Lincoln is the most formidable president, arguably politician in, in of the dem of the democratic era. Yeah, uh, and then at the same time, you know. Anyway, this is just in retrospect. Uh, now he has been, you know, deified essentially. Yeah, you can see, you can go to the quad in Washington and see his statue. Yeah, but he sits big and serene, you know. But he was his life was not not serene at all. Yeah. He actually fought. He almost fought a duel with broadswords at one point. Wow, <laughs> and he never won the popular vote. I mean, which obviously well, makes he did. Uh, yeah, he, he he lost most of the votes, but he did uh, he did win a few, and the most important one of course, being the presidency. Sure. But I mean, he didn't win the popular vote when he won the oh, presidency. Yes. You, you're point. quite right. Yeah. It was the four, four way. Which makes sense, uh, yeah. obviously, because otherwise, why would, you, why would you have a civil war? But still, it's an interesting fact. He, he won in a legal way. Yeah. This idea of elite overproduction, you're talking about it in relation to the United States today. So what does that mean? How, how do we have an overproduction of elites in the US? Who, who are these 
overproduced new elites in the US. So in the United States, um, you really need to go back into the 1970s because uh, the types of uh, processes that um, my colleagues and I study, they are slow, they are structural uh, trends that develop slowly. And that's way why they are to an extent predictable, even though future cannot be predicted very um, accurately, but we can predict some of these uh, slow moving um, forces. So what happened in the 1970s, the wealth pump, got turned on again. There is uh, a famous uh, graph that many people have seen where you look at how the productivity of workers was uh, growing and it continued to grow past the 1970s, but the uh, worker compensation grew together until the 1970s and then it's essentially stagnated and even declined. All right. So again, this uh, uh, created a, an extreme uh, flow of wealth from the workers to uh, the owners and, um, and the managers. And as a result of that, we saw something very similar to what happened in uh, uh, the first half of the 19th century. The sudden, ap sudden appearance of a, a large class of super wealthy people. So, for example, if, um, you know, in the book, I talk about the decimillionaires. These are the people who with the fortunes of 10 millions or more. Uh, over 40 period, uh, 40 year period of time, their numbers increased tenfold. I mean, this is pretty a remarkable uh, thing. So this is what, uh, this is one of the two important aspects of elite overproduction. The uh, production of newly wealthy people. Who, many of whom wanted to translate their wealth into political power. Again, think Trump, but not only him. Um, and so that created a huge pool of candidates for um, elections at various levels. And we see this, uh, that there is, uh, we see uh, this greater competition uh, because, you know, if, there, so if the supply of uh, some good stays constant, but demand for it grows, the price of the good goes up. And so the cost of elections uh, have been growing since the 1990s, reflecting this particular trend. And the more, um, the more um, uh, elite aspirants, the more uh, elite wannabes we have, the more of them uh, are frustrated because uh, not everybody can get a position. And as they are frustrated, they uh, become um, willing to challenge the rules of the game. The, Trump is also a good example in that. The elections of 2016 were really wild elections. So he was breaking all the rules, and he was and he was gaining uh, in, uh, in votes. Politically, he was breaking all the rules. Yes. You mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. We'll, we'll get to the conspiracy theories about whether or not he broke, you know, legal rules. The, your definition of the elite, and it was a, this was so helpful to me. Is you basically say it's the 0.1%, so not even the 1%, you know, the 0.1%, like you said, the super rich, or the 0.01%, plus the 10%. So upwardly mobile professionals who do really well out of the wealth pump, you know, they're not the Zuckerbergs and the Jeff Bezoses, but they're, you know, the affluent Californian lawyer couple who both went to an Ivy League university and have done That's right. really well out of the last 30 years. And that is the that is your definition of the elite. So I had a question really for you framing the US here against the UK, because we've had a really different 15 years to the US in this country. Since 2008, we've had very little, well, per capita, no economic growth fundamentally, zero productivity growth. And you've not seen a growth of the super rich in this country. What you have seen is a, is a shift in the economic model um, towards rentierism. And in this country, for instance, we have around, I think, two and a half million buy-to-let landlords Mm. So, and, th and that increasingly is how people feel affluent because they have a property which is gaining in value because asset wealth is being, like you say, part of the wealth pump. And you have an immiserated working class, but you don't have, you don't have the ultra rich like you do in the US. And, and, and therefore these 2.5 million, you know, buy to let allowance, they aren't failed aspirants. They aren't part of that elite. They aren't saying, oh, wow, I have this new economic power. It's frustrated because I can't express that politically, mm -hmm. or am I wrong? It, or so, how does that apply to, for instance, a country where there is clearly a massive upward shift in wealth, immiseration for the working class, but it's not oligarchic like the US. It's somewhere like the UK, where you actually have, you know, stagnant growth, 
rising inequality, but not these avatars like Musk, Bezos, and so on. Well, with the caveat that in order to do really proper uh, cliodynamic analysis, I have to work through uh, mm. tons of data. I have not done this for UK, so take my uh, remarks with a grain of salt. But let's compare United States and UK. Similar countries, but quite uh, different in some ways. So in United States, the uh, ruling coalition, uh, ruling uh, elites are a coalition between the wealth holders and um, degree holders, essentially. So because one of the routes to get into power is to get a law degree, for example, the most useful degree. Now, um, the uh, wealth holders dominate, really. There is some very good research showing that. In UK, I believe the um, balance is uh, shifted more to credential holders. So, uh, you know, uh, if you, in the United States, if you want to become the president, you go to Yale Law School. But here, if you want to become prime minister, you go to Oxford and study whatever, including classics, for example, <laughs> all right? So um, so what we need to look at is the, uh, uh, the, pro the best proxies for elite of production would be happening at the credential level rather than uh, wealth level. And that's very interesting. Just the other day, I was reading a very interesting article by an anonymous uh, Oxford uh, student, a member of the Feminist uh, Society uh, in the Telegraph, I believe, who was commenting on how uh, corrosive the uh, social environment is in uh, Oxford specifically, how uh, students uh, challenge each other and try to essentially destroy each other's reputations. And she explains it in, in almost identical terms to our theory, essentially because of the very intense competition uh, Intra-elite competition, um, the um, uh, the winners are, are using all kinds of underhanded, ugly uh, ways to get ahead in this competition. Yeah, that's that was an interesting one. I, I think it's something I see in academia as well uh, amongst younger academics. Well, not, I mean, I, I, you know, I, this is not to criticize academia, but there is often now the whole cancelling thing of where people within the academic profession try and cancel one another. That didn't happen. 20, 30, 40 years ago. Yep. And like you say, is that is that a function of like competitivity and competition and overproduction of those people? So we'll get back to Trump and we'll get back to the US. But you're saying the UK analog is overproduction of that, of that, let's say that 10%, that graduate class or the elite graduate class, people at UCL, Imperial. Can I make a comment about cancelling culture? Uh, please uh, go on. Yeah, his, just historical parallels. In cruder times, uh, cancelling was accomplished by dueling and killing your um, uh, your competitors. And we have data on the number of uh, duels, and we see the uh, a great increase in the frequency of duels before crisis in the 50, uh, 16th century, in the ninth, in the 19th century, and so on. So today, um, you don't get. Uh, Murder to you, just your, your reputation is oh, I love is destroyed. It. <laughs> what original explanation. I love it. <laughs> that is so um, that's so in interesting. So uh, the analog here, like we say, is the is the overproduction of of a certain layer of graduates. We're not saying that, you know, people with a business degree at London South Bank are running the country, they're not. But this overproduction of of, of degree holders from Imperial, LSC, Oxford, Cambridge, yada, 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 these top 10, 15 universities. These are the people who will be frustrated elite aspirants and who will become counter elites. And I found that quite an interesting explanation for, for Navarro Media, I have to say, mm -hmm. which is a media organization. We've got progressive values. We're on the left. We've emerged in a particular sort of political economic moment where living standards in this country are stagnating for most people. So I thought it was a really, really interesting sort of explanation. However, with the US and that coalition of the 0.1% and the 10%, you can see how that easily translates to political power, because of course, money. But when you have frustrated aspirants where it's mostly credential degree holders, how does that work? Have we got examples of that? Right. Uh, so remember, we talked uh, about the silver. Abraham Lincoln, he was a lawyer. It turns out that lawyers are the most dangerous people. Lenin was a law was trained as a lawyer. Castro was trained as a lawyer. Uh, Robespierre was a lawyer. Well, Gandhi was not a revolutionary, but he was also a lawyer. So, um, the, uh, so lawyers are actually uh, very uh, dangerous people because if you have um, a, a large uh, number of them, all right, and some of them uh, get frustrated in their goals, all right, then they are very smart, they're well-networked, 
they are good at organizing things. And so uh, in the past, uh, what we typically see is that revolutionary movements, revolutionary groups and parties would be organized by uh, such counter elites, the uh, frustrated uh, elites who turn uh, against the ruling regime. Now, I don't uh, see that necessarily in UK because I just don't know the situation sure. here. But in the United States, we see this at several levels. So, for example, if you look at um, Antifa um, uh, demonstrations, and some of them could can get quite violent, the huge majority of them are college uh, students or, or students who have college degrees, as opposed to the right-wing uh, extremists who tend to come from the non-college degree holders. And then um, in the United States, of course, situation cannot be the same as, say, preceding the Russian Revolution, because in um, uh, uh, in Romanov uh, Russia, the internal police, the secret police, it was like counted like a couple dozen uh, <laughs> individuals, right? Uh, FBI, of course, in the United States is extremely powerful organization. <laughs> And the surveillance is very so. This, the uh, coercive apparatus of the United States is so strong that no Bolshevik party that would try to violently overthrow uh, the regime is possible. So that uh, leaves uh, either rioting or mass murder going out and just shooting random people, or you can get organized and try to take over one of the parties. And so in my book, I talk about what I see uh, that this absurdant uh, Republicans, they're trying to take over the Republican Party and use that as the engine to both challenge and actually overthrow the uh, ruling elites. So let's let's pedal back here because this is super interesting because you talk about really, this has happened in both parties in the United States, obviously aided and abetted by the fact they have primaries. We don't have primaries in this country. So... Uh, much more friction to doing this. But you say really that frustrated elite aspirants are among progressives, try to do something similar. I mean, you sort of, you imp imply this. They fail with around Bernie Sanders and there's something similar going on with the Republicans and it, it seems increasingly might, like it might succeed. But explain this to me because the elite, like we've said, is the 0.1% plus the 10%. And you've said on the right that these people aren't generally degree holders. Oh, they so are. They are. Uh, you know, uh, Yale Law School uh, has produced a huge number of counter elites. So mm -hmm. J.D. Vance, for example. Okay. So it's not just um, somebody who left school at 16 who supports the Republican Party, who's part of this revolutionary movement in the Republicans. Well, they are the food, they could be foot, foot soldiers, soldiers yeah. but the organizers are the ones who have credentials and who are good at organizing. And they and they are very much 10% of the credentialed class. You said J.D. Vance. Talk about yeah. him for a moment. Well, uh, so J.D. Vance, he comes from a, from a working uh, background. Uh, he, of course, wrote the, uh, the Hillbilly Elegy, for which he became uh, quite well known. But then um, he went, um, he, he served, I think, in the Navy. But what more importantly, he uh, got into one of the premier law schools, Yale Law School, where he <clears> got his degree. And then he worked uh, in the finance industry. So he is, um, uh, by all means, he can be considered as part of the elites. And that's the typical thing in historical, um, other historical uh, crisis that we see. It's not peasants. Peasants can rebel, like what Tyler rebellion. It was uh, handily destroyed by mounted and armored knights. All right, uh, because peasants were not uh, well organized, not well armed, and so forth. Today is the same thing. You need organization to to uh, to make a successful revolution. You need uh, organization, and this organization comes from uh, people who uh, go through this, uh, uh, you know, education uh, process. So you have the combination of immiserated working class or peasantry plus a counter elite is what creates a successful revolutionary. Exactly. Force. So the two factors is, first of all, you have the popular immiseration that creates the pool of discontent that can be mobilized by elite entre entrepreneurs, essentially. And then you have to have those counter elites who are willing to challenge the status quo. And they are the ones who uh, organize things. So the Russian Revolution, uh, Lenin was certainly part of the elites, all right, and and uh, most of the Social Democratic Party. In fact, uh, most of the revolutionary parties, more than half of them, were nobility or 
um, or uh, children of uh, nobles, and the rest of them were uh, also had educational credentials. So it was not a worker uh, or peasant revolution at all. I love the, this example as well you give um, of a sort of a Russian equivalent um, of you know a Silicon Valley billionaire giving money to what was the Bolshevik or what would become yeah. the Bolshevik Party. That's Can you right. explain this anecdote? This was so eye-opening for me. Yes, exactly. Who was this person? Sava Morozov. He was a very, he was a remarkable person. Uh, he was one of the, I think, 10 richest uh, people in the, in, uh, Tsarist Russia. So around 1900 uh, or so. He was the patron of the arts. Um, he, but he also uh, genuinely cared about his workers. So he had manufacturers, uh, you know, producing clothing and, uh, he tried to create good working conditions for his workers. He sent them to be educated and so on and so forth. He was, he was a progressive. He wanted clearly to reform the Tsarist regime to make it more democratic and uh, more modern. And as part of that, he was supporting Social Democratic Party, for example. For example, he um, uh, financed the publication of their newspaper. So that would be the equivalent of having, you know, mass media or uh, electronic mass media today. Uh, and in fact, uh, he, uh, some of the uh, prints, uh, printers were uh, located in his manufacturers. Wow. Right. So, but um, he, as many, as most people, in fact, nobody, including myself, can really foresee uh, how uh, the society would develop without the mathematical apparatus. This, and we need, this is why we need the science of history. So he was probably, um, uh, uh, had all good intentions. But then when the revolution of 1905 broke out, he uh, realized, he saw that the country went in a completely opposite direction. The, suddenly this spiral of violence uh, just exploded. And uh, it was not what he wanted, not what he was working on. And this was one of those unintended consequences of your actions. And so he, um, he had a nervous breakdown and uh, his doctor sent him to uh, Côte d'Azur to, you know, to, uh, to get, uh, to recover. And there he either committed suicide or some people think he was uh, actually assassinated, but whatever, he, his life ended uh, in a very sad way. But the most interesting uh, part of this anecdote is what happened later. His wife inherited uh, most of his property, including his really wonderful palatial uh, country house just uh, south of uh, Moscow, was called Gorky. And uh, uh, in 1917, the Bolsheviks came, threw her out. Um, she had just a few jewelry left to her and she, she had to battle it to survive. And, and to add uh, an ironic twist to this, uh, the leader of the revolution, Vladimir Lenin, uh, moved into Gorky. It was his uh, principal uh, residence until he died. Wow. So the, the oligarch who helped fund the Bolshevik party had his palatial residence taken by the Bolsheviks. Exactly. Wow. There's a lesson there for multi-billionaire oligarchs out there. Maybe you don't, you know, I do help the radical left. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, uh, I'm just joking. Also on the, on the, on the Russian side, I mean, I knew that Lenin was, um, I knew that Lenin was a lawyer, uh, but then, and, 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 you know, Castro and so on, but then you offer as, as well the, the idea of Mao. Yeah. I, I forgot about this. Mao's a teacher. Yeah. So Mao, again, is part of that sort of credential 10%. So in this country, the idea of radicalized lawyers, I can't see as much as the US because mm -hmm. of the law school industry you have over there. Well, I'm sure they, they do exist. We have barristers going on strike, for instance, in this country in recent years. That's very new. But where I can really see it is amongst teachers. Highly credentialed, highly intelligent, highly capable. And until the last three, four years, nobody associated teaching unions in this country with radicalism. And now repeatedly they're going on strike because their working conditions and their living standards are, are sort of going down. So is this part of your hypothesis that potentially it's precisely these people mm -hmm. that the government should be trying to pacify, that they should be worried about? Well, uh, so uh, by the way, Hong, the leader of the Taiping Rebellion in the middle 19th century, was also a teacher. In fact, the top uh, leadership of Taipings, they were all failed, they all failed empirical, uh, imperial uh, exams, and they were making a living by teaching, and then they switched into uh, becoming revolutionaries. But I think, no, uh, with, um, uh, creating, um, 
outlets for the energy of uh, frustrated elites is a good thing, but that's not the only one. Uh, if you think about it, the most important thing we need to do is uh, to uh, turn off the wealth pump. Because ultimately, it's the wealth pump that drives both uh, immiseration and elite overproduction. All right. And also, maybe I don't, know, don't remember if I mentioned this. One of the reasons we have, let's say, uh, overreduction of uh, uh, youth uh, uh, looking for uh, advanced education is because they're trying to escape the immiserated classes, essentially. That's why they may not necessarily want to be uh, power holders, but they just want to get into the 10% let's say, so they could have a decent life. But of course, now you have 60% of the U.S. population, 60% uh, of um, uh, U.S. people who complete uh, high school, they go to college, over 60 actually. Oh, wow. All right. Uh, so clearly, and the, and the return on the college degree has been uh, collapsing over the past uh, 30 years. All right. So yes, finding them uh, good things to do uh, is important. We can talk about it. For example, my pet uh, idea is that um, uh, we love historians. Let's uh, hire more historians to do to, to generate more historical data. But more importantly, you have to work at a more fundamental level. If we um, uh, if you rebalance the um, uh, the society in such a way that the fruits of economic growth flow fairly to uh, both workers and employers, see, I'm not a uh, flaming revolutionary. I don't think we should destroy. Uh, the one percent is we should just rebalance mm -hmm. system where everybody gets their fair share that eventually will stop um, that um, elite overproduction pump also so it's, it sounds to me I'll, I'll put this in sort of British terms your argument against revolution civil war state breakdown political instability is social democracy mm. that's that's basically what it is you're saying adopt the economic model you have between 1945 and the early 1970s and the chances of political instability are very low, statistically. With one proviso. So social democracy worked extremely well uh, um, following the, in, from the 1920s and 30s, following the Great Depression and things like that. Uh, but a uh, hundred years have passed. Our societies have changed. So we should learn from them. But we don't necessarily need to do it precisely the same way. All right, again, coming, coming back to the common refrain, we need the science of history that would al allow us to actually have a decently working model for how our societies respond to various interventions and um, uh, nudges and things like that. So we can uh, calculate the, and eliminate the unintended consequences. Mm. All right. So many of those ideas, like increasing the taxes on the wealthy, you know, increasing minimum wage, you know, giving pow uh, power to workers, that they are probably going to be part of the mix. But exactly how uh, we uh, uh, recondition our society is going to be part of, first of all, a political process. And secondly, we would need to be able to calculate uh, to predict the consequences of different actions. But here's the thing, and I, I, by the way, I, I buy that analysis, and I think it's, it's empirically obvious to me, but if you look at Europe, say, after the 1960s, historically wealthy, historically egalitarian, and yet there's a huge insurgency of popular unrest. The largest strike in, in European history is in France, 1968. In Italy, you get something approaching a low-level civil war, frankly, between 68 and 1977. You know, thousands of, 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 of members of the intelligentsia, radicals, some accused of very serious things, thousands of people have to leave the country. So how does that, how does that get explained then, where we have historically wealthy countries, historically equal, and yet actually France, Italy, Germany, the UK – were far more radical civil societies in the late 1960s than they are today? Well, um, so um, in the model that I, in fact, used to project the trajectory of the United States uh, into the future, I used also something known as the youth bulge. So youth bulge is the unusually large number of the cohort of people aged 20 to 29. And these are they are the most dangerous in terms of um, these kinds of... Um, 
instability because uh, revolutions are really made by uh, young people. So what happened uh, in the 19, uh, late 1960s and early 1970s was that we uh, all uh, West, uh, Western societies experienced a very serious uh, youth bulge. And that temporarily depressed um, the uh, salaries of young people because there were just too many of them competing for the jobs. Although at that time, the institutions, uh, pro-labor institutions were still reasonably active in the States and certainly in uh, Europe. All right. Secondly, uh, that obviously created an um, extra number of elite aspirants. So that was one of the part of the reason. However, what, what, uh, what was the missing factor was there was no popular immiseration. The right. popular immiseration um, uh, happened that, that uh, the wealth pump tur got turned on only in the 1970s, and it, it, and it has to, had to work for you know, several decades before it would create this. Uh, so um, if you talk to people who lived, like my um, colleague Jack Goldstone, who is uh, also one of the uh, co-authors of the theory that uh, we are uh, working on, he grew up in California during the 1960s. It was, uh, but it was playful in many ways. You know, there is no such desperation, edge of desperation, as he uh, describes it, and many other people. And there was certainly no, uh, there was um, all this college, uh, uh, you know, uh, students who were, you know, uh, doing rebelling and doing th things like that. Th there was no um, uh, response from the working classes to that because. But there was in France. I mean, in France, mm -hmm. you do have a. Well, we'll return to this because I, I, I buy that explanation. Yeah. But France has a massive strike, millions of people in 1968. Right. I mean, they lose. De Gaulle wins the subsequent election, but there is. There is then, you know, industrial action or Italy, you know, Italy, we yeah. see massive walkout strikes in the late 1960s. Yeah, but they were, uh, uh, they were not lethal strikes. People didn't get killed. Like uh, in the 1920s, for example, in the United States, uh, there were strikes when uh, dozens of people would get killed. In fact, there was a whole uh, mini civil war in uh, Virginia, uh, in coal mine, in the mines of Virginia. So, um, yes, I don't want to diminish it, um, because there was, uh, uh, definitely, uh, an outbreak of instability, of social uh, instability at th that time. But uh, remember, again, let's take uh, Italy, Brigadier Rossi, right? Mm. They uh, had uh, quite a lot of support amongst the um, credentialed classes, yeah. but no support from the workers. So uh, so there was, um, uh, in, in many ways, uh, massive uh, labor strikes, um, if they are not uh, violent. Right. That's um, how um, a democracy um, and a capitalist democracy should operate because workers need to have power to express their, you know, displeasure and get, you know, better deals. Right. So, um, um, again, um, I don't want, uh, I don't have the specific numbers for France or Italy. Right. That's, that's why I am, you take my comments with a grain of salt. But uh, from what it looks like at the first blush, that uh, the structural conditions for crisis were not there. Mm. I think that's a, I think that's a really compelling argument. So what you're saying is what we have right now is, is widespread immiseration, the wealth pump, overproduction of elites, and what you see in the 1960s is this youth bulge. And under both conditions, you see political instability. But the the, the former one of the of the immiseration and wealth pump seems more dangerous. Of course, North Africa. In the 2010s, yes. the late 2010s, has all of these things combined. Exactly. Which is what explains the Arab Spring. Yeah. So Egypt is a great example. I have a, a colleague that uh, who studied it uh, very carefully. So there we have numbers. First of all, they had a huge uh, youth uh, bulge. But on top of that, um, in, during the uh, 1990s and early uh, 2000, they uh, quadrupled the number of college graduates. And there were no, uh, there was no increase in the jobs for them to, um, uh, to uh, take. So the rural, uh, uneducated youth supported the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, but the primary move, uh, moving uh, force, the uh, troops, revolutionary troops, were those uh, college graduates that had no jobs. They basically, the only option was for, for them to go back to the village and become, you know, a peon again. And so they went, and they went to Tahrir, and that's how Mubarak government uh, fell. So we have this, uh, like I say, this intersection of all, all three of those. Are there any places elsewhere right now where you see something similar to, to North Africa then? 
in that period of elite overproduction, popular immiseration, and a youth bulge. Where, where else do we see these three things combined right now? Well, in the United States, we had a, a smaller youth bulge because they tend to follow the generational things. Uh, that, but it sort of peaked during the late 20 teens. So right now, it's declining. Because millennials were a youth bulge to an extent, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Because uh, it's like a shadow reflection of the baby boomer mm. uh, generation. But um, in terms of um, uh, future youth bulges, uh, what, uh, what is um, a positive development, in fact, is that birth rates have been collapsing, even in places where you would not think they would, like India, for example, Iran, all right? So there's still, um, uh, it's still happening in black um, Africa, in South, in Sub-Saharan um, Africa, and that's where um, we would uh, we should see a lot of uh, uh, political dysfunction uh, in the next. But that's of course uh, easy an easy pre prediction yeah. in many ways because yeah. So someone like Nigeria has, I think, a median age of like sixteen. That's right. You know, so this is basically like a highly likely it's place. A bomb. It's a population bomb. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, do we live in a democracy? You said that elites will always exist. So, you know, it's it's a platitude. We say, well, we live in a democracy. Well, do yeah. we live in a democracy? In the United States, no. Um, I, I, as I argue in my book, the United States is a plutocracy. Thanks to uh, political scientists uh, such as Martin Gillens in particular, who have done um, an amazingly uh, in a lot of uh, work, uh, um, to cut the long story short, they, they showed with huge amounts of data that if you take the pre uh, preferences of the, uh, they divided the uh, uh, American population into deciles. So if you take the lower nine deciles, 90% of the population, take their uh, preferences, uh, and try to see whether they have any influence on the legislation uh, and uh, policy uh, that's adopted in Washington. Zilch, nada. <laughs> it's, uh, and it's probably, it's not 10%, it's probably just that you didn't have data to refine it very closely. It's probably the top 1%. It's really top 1% that drives all the uh, political decisions in the United States for reasons which are any sort of obvious once you start thinking about the, how the political process how the sausage is made you know mm. in the united states all right but they have shown with numbers uh this um, uh, this particular uh, result so what kind of democracy is that that uh does not really take into account the desires of the 90 percent of its population so analytically it's a very strong argument to say that the united states is not a democracy yeah, we have the democratic uh, trappings, we have the elections, um, you know, and many other things, but it's not uh, working uh, for the majority of the population as democracies should. And you have this nice phrase about the center. You know, we hear about the center a lot um, in this country at the moment, obviously post Brexit and but really after the 2010s, a very sort of politically volatile decade in, in, in the UK. And people talk about the centre and obviously in- one, Sorry, what's the word, what's the word censor? The centre. Centre, oh, centre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we think about it as like this, you know, it, 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 it exists in positional relation to the left and the right. And so the centre should be taking elements of both and it should be very popular. It's about compromise. But what you say is, no, the centre isn't this thing. The centre is elite preferences. Mm-hmm. And so they talk about it as the center because, of course, they don't want to say, no, it's just our preferences. Screw the rest of you. Yeah. They have to phrase it as this thing which is beyond ideology and you know, compromise. Is that, yeah. is that a fair representation of the center and, quote, centrist politics? Yes. Um, so uh, the centrist politics right now epitomized by the Democratic Party. And of course, this is all dynamic. Democratic Party was the party of working people back during the New Deal times and for a long time after that. But now it's not. It's the party um, of 10%, as uh, Tom Frank would um, uh, uh, characterize them. And so um, what they are reflecting, the central uh, preferences of the ruling class, who are, again, the coalition of the wealth holders and the top degree uh, holders. All right. But the rest, 90%, uh, um, in fact, are not counted in this uh, center. And that's why it is misleading to call it uh, a center. It's yeah, it's a it's a center. It's, a, it's an elite center. Mm. And the UK, where, where where do we exist on this 
Don't know enough uh, to be uh, able. Maybe, yeah, don't don't uh, have enough information. The to... wise man knows what he does not know. <laughs> that's Peter Turchin. I'm a scientist. Yeah, no, it's I, good. No, yes. it's, it's good. No, but it's, it's an interesting one because I think the argument for the United States being a plutocracy is, is very clear. I mean, you know, this is a country which, let's say, it's been a democracy really since 1964, Civil Rights Act. No major party has gone to the American electorate offering universal health care. Like no, no major party even offered it in an election. I just find that utterly remarkable. It's a democracy. Well, if people don't get to cho choose on these sorts of things, I would sort of suggest not. The UK, on the other hand, I think is not a plutocracy. I think it's a very limited democracy, um, a managed democracy increasingly. One example you give of, an, of another plutocracy, though, which is really relevant right now, is Ukraine. Um, and you talk about really, it's, this is one of the best bits of the book. And you talk about really how the, the battle within Ukraine, particularly in 2014, was really a battle between competing factions of the oligarchical class. And of course, now it's been invaded by Russia. And you say that fundamentally, Ukraine remains a plutocracy and it ceases to exist, or it becomes a militocracy. And I think that's probably true. And you know, there was that phrase from Zelensky right at the start of the war where he says, we'll basically become like a big Israel. You know, a garrison state. Mm -hmm. is, is that is that? Do you think a fair assessment? Ukraine, if it's going to exist with this very powerful neighbour to its sort of east, it can't be a plutocracy anymore because it simply won't be able to defend itself. Well, the historical record shows that plutocracies are ext extremely fragile because the plutocrats in power, first of all, don't have any popular support. But even more importantly, they're constantly uh, falling out amongst themselves. And that's what we saw in Ukraine in the run up to uh, 2022. So, but what's happening, I wrote this uh, almost a year ago, um, but what's been happening since then is that um, there is the plutocrats are definitely on their way out. So one of them, like Ahmedov, Linat Ahmedov, for example, his wealth was destroyed when his major factory in Mariupol was uh, destroyed during the fighting. Another one, Kolomoisky, who actually is the one who introduced and funded Zelensky uh, in the beginning. He has been on the outs uh, with the uh, current uh, Kyiv uh, regime, and they've been taking away his wealth uh, from him. The third one, Firtash, is uh, sitting in Vienna waiting uh, for deportation to the United States. So essentially, they've been decimated. So that part is uh, seems to be in progress. The uh, remaining question is whether um, Ukraine uh, will lose the war or, uh, you know, and then it will be fragmented probably, or uh, whether they win uh, the war and in the process turn into a meritocracy. And this could be done either uh, in a variety of ways. So Zelensky, for example, has repositioned himself as the war leader. So that's one possible route. Or it could be one of the generals that might replace him. And that would then it would be formal uh, militocracy, in fact. So Zaluzhny, for example, has been uh, getting a lot of good press in, in Western press until the last week or so. And um, uh, so he has been even suggested as a possible um, successor to Zelensky. So those two um, uh, routes, uh, one of them is the most likely outcome, it seems. This was fascinating to me. And it, it would clearly have implications for how we, we view democracy in, in the West, because let's say that, let's say Ukraine, quote unquote, winning, or even if there's a frozen conflict, but it's still a, a viable large nation state, and they join NATO, there's talks of EU accession, et cetera, et cetera that wouldn't be viable if it remained a plutocracy. And all of a sudden that brings into question some of the sort of core assumptions about Eastern and Central European integration to the European Union, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, that could change the whole debate around what a, a Western democracy even looks like if it has to have militocratic elements. I mean, right. I mean, arguably Israel already does that, of course, but this would be another one. Well, uh, no, I would say that the European Union has actually demilitarized before this. And that, and that I believe has been a good, um, uh, that has been a good development 
because uh, demilitarization decreases the chance of war and also decreases the chance of really uh, destructive uh, wars. And um, very, uh, one of the, um, this is a ter terrible situation what we have in Ukraine because literally hundreds of thousands of people are getting killed, right? But it also is horrible as how it affected the European Union because it is now remilitarizing. They're planning to build uh, new factories, uh, increase the uh, military and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. This is uh, all bad, um, you know, trends going in the wrong directions, in my opinion. But there is the argument that, and, and you sort of make this in the book, that wartime mobilization or, or, or the aftermath of awful conflicts often give rise to, you know, democratic moment. So we see it after World War One, for instance, across the European continent, obviously after World War II, you know, so, so you don't see the possibility of a bigger share of the economic pie going to workers alongside remilitarization. I'm not, vener I'm not venerating remilitarization. I agree with the many downsides of it. I think war is awful, et cetera. And I'm not arguing for it, but there is, there is a potential argument where you start to see a more egalitarian political economy going hand in hand with remilitarization, or do you not, yeah. do you not buy that? Well, I have another book. It's called Outer Society, how 10,000 years of war made us uh, into uh, wealthy societies and uh, good societies. So uh, in that has been, that's the empirical finding that uh, competition between societies, which until recently and even now has been taking the form of warfare, has been um, a major driver of cultural and social evolution. But I end that book uh, by, because I am a committed, uh, I am against war, you know, and we can get the same type of evolution um, of, of pro-sociality mm -hmm. and, co and cooperation without killing people. Competition is important, but, you know, after all, uh, uh, firms compete in the market, all right? And when a firm, uh, you know, goes bankrupt, uh, people uh, working for the firm don't get killed, right? They go working for some other firm. So that's uh, my model. We should, we need competition between societies, but what we need to do as the humanity as a whole is to put that competition into nonviolent forms. And that has been happening uh, partly. The United States, so the Soviet Union, for example, the country where I grew up, it was not conquered, uh, did not collapse as a result of war with the United States or anything. It lost uh, competition in providing a high quality of uh, living for its citizens. All right. And there was, it was more complex, uh, complex story than that, but it essentially uh, collapsed uh, as a result of losing competition um, in providing, you know, uh, the well-being. Uh, and so that's, uh, that seems uh, to me a good model. Uh, and also a big um, factor uh, behind the Arab Spring. The populations were there. Uh, they were demanding that the governments would become more functional and better at uh, uh, providing good life uh, uh, broadly shared. So I see, and I hope maybe this is not, I uh, don't really see it, it's my hope that we will evolve to the point where we can abolish wars and put competition, which is good and necessary, into much more productive channel. Why did Donald Trump win the 2016 presidential election? What's the explanation there? <laughs> Um, that's, um, uh, the two, the, the two structural factors, popular immigration and the literal production working together. So Trump is one of this cohort of, uh, wealthy, uh, people who wanted to translate wealth into power. So he's one of those huge extra number of millionaires and uh, even billionaires who have been uh, entering the political scene. And how did he, he get um, to power? He mobilized uh, the population, the immiserated population that has been left behind by both party. Well, uh, the Republicans have traditionally, well, traditionally in the uh, uh, recent history have been the party of 1%. Right. The Democrats made a transition from the party of the working class to the party of 10 percent of the credentialed uh, class. And so there was nobody representing the, let's say, the um, uh, majority of population who don't have college degrees and whose um, uh, incomes have been uh, sorry, his wages uh, have been declining, uh, in fact, in uh, absolute terms. All right. And so, uh, so they are the ones who, mm, who, uh, who, um, voted for 
Trump in large numbers. And that's why he got many of the Obama Democrats, because, you know, he um, uh, capitalized on uh, that pent up uh, uh, discontent, popular discontent. And the, 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 but the liberal argument from the coast, they would say, Peter, how could you say this? Um, and, and, and some of it's true. African Americans, for instance, who are the most immiserated by the wealth pump since the 1970s, they still vote Democrat um, in, in, in 2016, more so in 2020, but of course, Joe Biden wins. Right. So, and also it's important to say in 2020, I mean, Trump gets an enormous number of votes, I think 75 million. He loses, of course. But that, and, I suppose, and that's after COVID mm -hmm. and so on. And so is that because of immiseration or is there something I mean, deeper going on? You know, a, a lot of American social scientists or commentators would kind of point to sweet, generous arguments about the US. They would say it's about whiteness, about whiteness, mm -hmm. the wages of whiteness, the loss of white privilege, concerns about becoming a minority majority country, which I, I think that's probably something to that, right? In the 2060s, but you don't you don't buy those explanations, or you don't think they're as significant as others do. Well, race is a very important part of um, both American history and culture. It's a very big factor in politics. So I talk about this in the book. But uh, getting back to Trump, um, one um, important group of um, um, of, um, of um, population in the United States is the Latinos that you uh, might want to take into account. So, um, um, on the, uh, at the first blush, uh, Trump should not do well with Latinos because he's a bigot, uh, and so on and so forth. But we know that, uh, over the past, uh, four or five years, Latinos have been increasingly switching to Republicans and in particular, um, in, uh, to voting for Trumps. And even amongst the, uh, African Americans, uh, there, there, there is an increasing, it's not, it's not still the, uh, the majority by any means, but the increasing minority that are actually becoming, uh, for Trump. So he is appealing uh, ahead of 2024, potentially, you mean? Uh, well, uh, even, um, by 2020. Right. You know, so, um, uh, he, uh, has been making inroads, uh, into all those. And of course, it's not just a miseration. Remember the divisions amongst the elites. So the Democrats, for example, are, uh, uh, uh were quite divided, especially in 2016 when Bernie should have really got a uh, nomination and there was all kinds of, uh, you know, um, 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 uh, um, uh, uh, ugly kind of uh, politicking going on behind the lines. Uh, they it's very are, diplomatic language there, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, uh, I, I'm, I, uh, I'm not partisan. I don't want. I, I want to criticize all parties equally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they were divided uh, amongst uh, themselves, and um, so uh, um, uh, Clinton, uh, Hillary, Hillary Clinton, was not. Um, uh, a candidate who would appeal to even um, uh, uh, workers who traditionally voted for Democrats, all right? So, so these are the types of uh, divisions uh, that um, that also had a very important explanatory role in the rise of Trump. Are the next eighty years going to be like the last eighty? Uh, and this is something I've really thought about a lot because the, the last 80 is just in so many ways, so unique. You know, people talk about the great acceleration and our relationship to the planet, unprecedented in our 200,000 year history, population boom. You know, uh, my grandmother's died. She was born in 1926. She was born in a planet with 2 billion people. She left the world on a planet of 7.5 billion people. So, so much has changed. And I, and I think part of the reason why we have political elites who are incapable of addressing problems is because for the most part, the last 50, 60, 70 years, since the Second World War have been good. Yeah. And they presume, and it's a cognitive bias, right? The past was good, therefore the, uh, the future will be good. So I, I, that's the question really. Do you think the past is a good indicator of the future in terms of political instability for the West? In, not directly, because I'm against making direct uh, historical analogies with any particular uh, uh, events in the past. That's, that's very amenable to cherry picking uh, and other problems. But um, the uh, models uh, that we have developed and tested on historical material, right? They are capable, in fact, for uh, helping us understand where we are 
and where we can and where we should go. So you're quite right. You know, we had the 30 glorious years, as the French uh, often uh, call them, the past um, uh, World War II. And, um, and, but this is, this is typical. Societies, uh, all complex societies, our data show, they experience this alternating periods of integrative versus disintegrative phases. Roughly speaking, century, but it actually is variable. Uh, so it's not p uh, pure um, mathematical cycles. It's more a woman bust type of dynamics. Anyway, what happens after a society has for a long time experienced internal peace and order, the elites um, who uh, the elites who have seen the previous period of a disintegrative, uh, they have died off or retired, and the new elites forget the lessons that were learned. And then uh, there is a great temptation to re re reconfigure the economy in ways that would benefit them, and that's how they turn the wealth pump invariably in the past. So in the future, we have to learn how to prevent this from happening, all right? And so um, what will happen um, in the next uh, 80 years? Um, if uh, the history, if the, if we uh, don't learn from uh, history, or more uh, importantly, if we don't have working science of history, then uh, we will be doomed to repeat this integrative, disintegrative uh, periods. So we'll be entering a disintegrative period. Yeah. So what does we, that mean? So we are right now in a disintegrative uh, period. Uh, it's the period uh, when the elites are on the um, uh, 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 competing and um, uh, in fighting. There is a lot of social dysfunction because of that. Um, and that dysfunction can um, de degenerate into bloody civil war or even uh, civilizational collapse. So that's not a huge probability of that. So that's, and that uh, tends to recur. Uh, sometimes uh, it lasts for a hundred years uh, because you have recurrence of this um, uh, periods of, um, of uh, internal infighting. So if no, if we don't turn the, the wealth pump now in the United States, for example, then the model says that we will get another one and the peak in 2070s or so, because there are roughly 50 a uh, year. Of uh, social instability and yeah, violence. Yeah. So uh, eventually, if the wealth pump is not turned uh, down, turned off, then um, uh, eventually people will get tired of uh, this uh, 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 instability and there will be an uneasy peace. All right. All right. And then um, uh, the new generation will come who are not tired of instability because they did not experience it. That will, by, so by 2070, we'll have another peak of this. So we're in a sort of mini peak at the moment for the US, or we're entering a mini peak with the 2020s. Well, it could be, it, it could become a major peak. It could become a major yeah. peak. So for example, all right, in um, the previous um, uh, disintegrative period in the United States, there was a huge big peak in the 1960s, uh, sorry, 1860s. All right, and then it was followed by a smaller peak in 1920s, which actually did not lead to civil war, partly because some people were still uh, remembered the civil war and they did not want to bring it about, and partly for some additional reasons I talk about in my book, right? So, so you're talking uh, about so uh, Roosevelt and the New Deal yeah. and so on. So if this peak is not very violent, the next one will be more violent. But if this peak is very violent, the next peak will be less violent. Oh, That's, that seems to be the pattern uh, in history. I see. And, and, and a big part of this, like you say, is, is interrelate, but also broader social solidarity. I mean, you see it in this country after the experience of the Second World War, the, the, the treatment in this country of Jeremy Corbyn by the press and by opposition political parties, his own political party, that simply can't happen in a post-war society in the 1950s, the 1960s, because you have a shared experience he probably would have served in the Second World War, like mm -hmm. Wilson or like Macmillan or like, you know, uh, all of these politicians that we get ready in the post-war period. Mm -hmm. And there was a sense of there are certain things you don't do because we were comrades. Yeah. We had the shared cultural experience. Yes. And that's now gone. And also, shared, the dis shared dysphoric experience is the technical dysphoric term. Dysphoric experience. Yes, okay. because it actually is a very important uh, uh, psychological force that makes people much more willing to cooperate. Yes, exactly. And, and because we haven't had that, 
we now see a dehumanizing of political opponents, which just now just seems the norm in our culture, yes. precisely because we haven't had that experience. Is that right? Yeah. But also because um, I presume, uh, I don't have the numbers, but I presume um, you have too many uh, candidates, too many um, aspirants for uh, power positions, and that uh, uh, probably drives um, in the large uh, um, uh, part the um, the uh, uh, tenor of the debate. This is certainly what happened in the United States. I right? think I think that's partly it for sure. Yeah. But I also just do think that you know, the, particularly the British establishment, it prides itself on understatement, reserve. You know, it's not personal. Yeah. And actually, you look at politics in this country over the last ten years; it's bloody personal. Yeah. Uh, it's not like oh, he's a good chap, but I just don't think he should be the prime minister. We we disagree. It, that has disappeared. I mean, you saw a bit of it with John McCain and Obama. Presumably that comes out of the experience of the Vietnam War, where John McCain mm -hmm. says to that woman famous, famously, he goes, he's a good man, he's a patriot, we just happen to disagree on politics. Right. You know, that has now disappeared from Anglo-American political life, it seems. Yeah. And we probably need this dysphoric experience for it to come back. I mean, ideally not, but... Ideally without uh, yeah. fighting a war. Please. <laughs> so what, what other kind of, kind of dysphoric experiences are there, if not war, that bring people together? Yeah, usually these are pretty violent. This is my colleague Harvey Whitehouse at Oxford who studies these types of things. And typically his uh, examples are, um, you know, uh, radical groups that are suppressed by the state, you know, uh, the war, uh, the warring uh, parties and things like that. Um, you can um, uh, do, you can do a boot camp type of a thing, which is very dysphoric experience and that's quite that's actually good in melding a group so maybe uh it would be a little artificial right uh, but perhaps that could be a good trick uh, to put uh, politicians through a boot camp so <laughs> they, can, they, can, they can bond yeah. you know and then they would probably not uh behave so nastily yeah. to each other national service but yes. just for politicians yes exactly national service and uh, <laughs> na national service is a very good idea as a um, as an alternative to the army, because you don't train people to kill, you mm. train people to do uh, good social things. Yeah, yeah. Plant trees and whatnot, the, the real challenge of the 21st century. Yeah. Why is Tucker Carlson so popular in the United States? Mm. Well, because for the same reason um, um, as Trump uh, was so popular, because he has positioned himself um, uh, as a critic of the ruling class. In fact, he uses these words. Uh, New York Times has uh, done uh, a great uh, numerical study, and they studied how many, uh, what are the difficult, di different tropes that he uses. The ruling class is one of three most common uh, tropes that uh, he uses. And so uh, he basically has been arguing, um, uh, both in his book, which is actually much uh, better than his uh, persona uh, on, um, uh, on uh, now, well, uh, closed uh, program, um, but he has been talking, among other things, um, he has been talking about how the working class was left behind by both uh, parties. And uh, that is uh, clearly uh, a big part of his appeal. Because it's true. It is true, exactly. Even if you think it's just a rhetorical tactic on his part, which obviously people on the yeah. left think that, it's, he's saying something which is accurate. It's true, but um, the large swaths of the American elites don't think it's true. I've talked to many uh, representatives. I, I have actually a character in my book um, uh, where, uh, where we have a discussion on this, all right? And she says, no, I mean, the life has never been uh, better. Yeah, and it has been better for her and 1%. But, uh, and the, the jet, uh, you know, uh, set, uh, elites running, uh, uh fly, uh, flying around the, wo the world, but, um, it has not been better for, uh, common Americans. So put the data behind this because there's, we've had the same thing in this country. And in the book, you talk just about the US, but it's exactly the same line you hear. Oh, things have never been better. How could you say that? The sun is out. Tottenham Court Road, look, the, the queue for press a manger is 10 people deep. Yeah. The, the economy is booming. So how has the life of the average American gotten worse since the 1970s? What's the data you draw on to, yeah. to paint that picture? But let's start with the data that um, she and uh, other members of the privileged uh, class draw on. They say, uh, look at Max Roser, Rosen, um, um, 
or is it Rosar, um, uh, uh, website. It shows that life is getting better. The number of people in poverty in the globe is, is collapsing. Yeah, because it's, most of them were in China, all right? So uh, in the United States, I do this um, a surgery on this. So I start by saying typically, People tell you, oh, the incomes have been increasing faster than uh, the inflation. But part of the reason is that we have uh, not a single worker worker in a uh, household, but two workers, and now often three or, or more, because children sometimes stay in. So you need to look at how much each individual is uh, working. And then uh, much of that uh, progress uh, disappears. Next, um, you want to look at two different classes. The college-educated uh, class has uh, done reasonably well until recently. But if you look at uh, working class defined as people without college education, they've been not just stagnating, they, they've been actually losing uh, ground. And then this is using... The, so their wages have been buying less for, the, exactly. for the a real, very long time. Exactly. The real wages have been declining. Yeah, for a long time. Yeah. Yes, for over 40 years. And then um, this is using the government statistics on inflation. And it is very opaque. We don't know what uh, precisely they include in the basket. In fact, they have uh, several different measures, uh, two different measures of inflation that don't necessarily agree with each other. But if you look in a simple-minded way, let's think about what if you're working class, uh, what do you want to do to feel good? You want to buy a house, right? You also want to give uh, college education to your uh, children. Well, um, you have to, uh, co compared to 40 years ago, a working class family had to work 40% more time for to get a house. And they had to work four times as long to get to put people through college. Four times. So this is... Uh, this is uh, what uh, losing ground. Yeah, I mean that's really a very means. That's a very high rate of inflation for the for the biggest investments out there, right? Which exactly. Is housing and education. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Education has been exploding because there is a huge demand for it. Mm. People want to escape precarity, all right, uh, and move into the ten percent, and so large numbers of them flock to colleges. Uh, but um, uh, as a result of it, uh, uh, the the demand increases and the Cost of college also followed. So, so people like Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, in this country, Jeremy Corbyn, to a lesser extent, Boris Johnson, he didn't really say it as much, but somebody like Dominic Cummings, that their political sort of platform is based on saying, life's gotten worse for most of you. We hear you. Um, and to a significant extent, liberal political elites are still resistant to that. Not entirely, it should be said. I mean, there's clearly a, a change in the Biden administration to, you know, the Obama administration, right? They talk a lot more about trade unions, the importance of growing out in the middle of the economy and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's, it's still very gestural, isn't it? Sort of liberal elites still don't really, when I say liberal elites, I mean the people that really control the progressive parties in the US, the UK, they, they don't really, they don't really believe that life's gotten worse for most people over, over recent decades. So these conversations you're having in the US, you say with say, you know, moderately affluent people um, in the credential class or the top 0.1%, there, there's not really a change there or are they beginning to understand what's going on? Have some of these people, you know, these lawyers or these tech CEOs, have they read your book and gone, mm -hmm. oh my God, Peter Turchin, he's onto something. And I asked that because I did TED in Vancouver, but obviously mostly Americans, last April. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked at the number of people, very affluent people, very successful people, people that worked for major tech companies saying, a civil war in the US is not an impossibility in my lifetime. I would not have said that 10 years ago, which is what your book is all about. Yeah. So, so do you think this analysis is beginning to cut through to those kinds of circles or uh, is this a cognitive bias on my part? Am I, am I hearing what I want to hear? Well, so my analysis, um, uh, you, you could see things happening uh, before people realized uh, what's happening because these trends, uh, they need, uh, uh, you know, many years, sometimes decades 
to really bring about uh, the uh, conditions that drive the crisis. But it has become increasingly obvious since t- uh, 2010 or so that uh, uh, that uh, things are falling apart. The dysfunction increases, the bitterness um, in the political class is increasing, um, and the popular discontent is also increasing. So uh, those are the... Um, uh, uh, external obvious manifestations of the deep moving forces. So you could, that's that's why in principle, you could probably predict it back in the 1990s. In fact, Jack Goldstone has was very prescient about it. He wrote uh, even back in the 1990s that we seem to be stepping uh, on the wrong track uh, here. But um, it becomes obvious to all only, um, you know, Actually, by uh, January 6, 2021, 20, uh, that's when it became gla- glaringly The, the Trump insurgency uprising. Uh, the, yeah, the, uh, the, the storming of the Capitol. So was, this a, was that a mini dysphoric event for the U.S. establishment, the U.S. elite? Mm-hmm. A mini one? A mini one. And they sort of get their heads together and go, oh, goodness, actually, we need to take these... Forces, but I don't seriously. see that. I, I think they uh, have sort of said, "Okay, need this uh, bad Trump at that point, and that's, uh, now we're done with him." Right. So it's just one person. That. But unfortunately, the Trump is coming back. Yeah. You know, he has a pretty reasonable chance at uh, becoming president. So now they are um, uh, worried about him. But also, your point is, it's not just about bad Trump. These mm-hmm. are broader social forces, and eventually yeah. they'll find expression through other people. Yeah. Well, I suppose that's the big difference between you and a lot of the sort of mainstream liberal punditry in the US, you know, MSNBC or whatever, bad Trump or exactly. bad one or two people, but you're saying actually no. It's either no. bad Trump or Vlad, bad Vlad, uh, Putin, you know, there is all, you can blame all kinds of, or you can blame the right wing, uh, you know, uh, extremists. Uh, so uh, there is plenty of victims to blame around. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, you, back to your point, um, there is a number of established politicians. We were talking about Bernie, you know, Sanders, uh, J.D. Vance. In fact, uh, uh, they have uh, some of the policy proposals that they make, they are actually quite similar. In fact, it would be uh, great if they could work uh, together uh, to try to bring this, uh, you know, across the, to make oh, this cooperation across the That will really line. upset our audience, Peter. <laughs> the idea of J.D. Vance and P- uh, Bernie Sanders, well, that must be said, I remember when, because um, <clears throat> obviously Steve Bannon, who's num- another one of these sort of frustrated aspirant elites, like yes. say, mm-hmm. Goldman Sachs, finance, yep. and, and so on. He got, um, you know, uh, also, um, he was his business school, I think yeah. Harvard Business School. Yeah. yeah. So again, it's a uh, credential Ex-military. route credential route to yeah. uh, elite, to counter elite. And I remember him saying that they were going to do a trillion dollar sort of infrastructure stimulus mm-hmm. right at the start of the Trump presidency. And Sanders was the only one who said, okay, I'm listening. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't saying, oh yeah, great. I love it. Let's work together. He said, I'm listening. Mm-hmm. Whereas everybody else said, I will not work with you under any circumstances. Yeah. But, you know, Bernie was the only one who I think, and I think Bernie, frankly, channels a certain part of, of blue collar America that most democratic politicians simply don't. Yeah, I think he's very unique in doing that. Even in, and in this country, I'll be honest, I don't see, I don't see any politicians doing it on the left. Sorry, to so the same extent. Now that, now that Corbyn is gone, well, even even Corbyn, who mm-hmm. I, I very much admire and I like, he didn't channel the the blue collar politics and angst and anger, which is often very ugly, by the way. Yeah. yeah, he didn't channel it in the same way that you see Bernie channeling it. I mean, Bernie. I mean, I had the privilege of seeing him not long ago, he came over here. He is like a machine for turning right-wing talking points into progressive arguments. Mm-hmm. You know, you can see somebody making quite racist argument or whatever against something and Bernie would, he'd invert it and give it a class analysis, mm-hmm. which, you know, we, we, we never really had that here, I think, to the same extent. Towards the end of the book, you talk about um, the US Civil War. Mm-hmm. Could you have predicted the US Civil War and its outcome in particular? This is really fascinating for me because obviously we're looking now at the Russia-Ukraine war. We'll talk about that in a moment. Could you have predicted the outcome of the of the Confederacy versus the Union? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, in uh, yeah, I talk about uh, the fictional um, uh, characters who invented the science of cryology, um, and uh, uh, honestly, uh, so let's say let's put it this way: if I was um, an Alpha Centaurian xenosociologist. 
Who Alpha was Centaurian. Uh, yes. Just for, for, yeah. So this is another star, uh, an alien star. civilization. I'm yeah. sitting there with the macroscope, uh, and I've been watching the human uh, history for several hundreds of years. So I had time to build my mathematical models, you know, test them with data. Uh, then uh, I would um, uh, I, I would bet that such a, um, a xenosociologist would predict in the 1850s could predict uh, that there would be a, a civil war. Uh, it would not be able to predict uh, necessarily the severity of it because that is uh, very difficult to predict. But it would be able to predict the, uh, that there would be an occurrence. Uh, and uh, yeah, and the and the outcome. So explain to me. Because you draw upon this fictional story where there's these two people, they're talking yeah. about who will win. Yeah. One of them does a bunch of maths on the on the chalkboard. The other one's jaw drops and goes, oh, wow, yeah, the Confederacy has no chance whatsoever. That's right. So so explain to me how a mathematical model can, can basically show a high probability for that kind of outcome. Yeah. Well, we know that um, the South had fewer uh, men of, uh, you know, uh, of fighting um, uh, age compared to the North. Um, and so the, um, the numerical uh, difference was one to four. But on the other hand, um, those Southern gentlemen, they were riding horses, shooting uh, rifles. Uh, and so they were, uh, and most of the officers were actually from the South and they defected to the South. So you would say that, you know, let's say they're twice as effective. So there's not such a huge differential. And here is where a mathematical uh, model uh, of battle uh, dynamics comes and helps. It, uh, I won't explain it with arm waving. You read my, read my book on this. <laughs> but essentially, the, if you have an advantage of one to two in a uh, numerical force, it actually gives you a, in the probability of winning is one to four. It's two to the squared. That's uh, that's what that's that's uh, non obvious in South. But it follows directly. Once you read the details, you will see how it works. And so that means that the North had a much, much huger advantage over the South. And I'm not even incorporating yet the details that all the major industries producing arms and ammunition. They made like 30 guns to every one gun the exactly. South made. Of course, the Southerners were importing yeah. um, a lot of those, running the blockade and so on and so forth. So, so it becomes a more complex model, but it is very hard to overcome that. So the one to four advantage is actually one to 16. All right, four to the square, yeah, square so, power. So it's very hard to overcome this one to 16 advantage. So it's just, yeah, just to clarify, the North, in terms of fighting age men, because of course a big part of the Southern population was slaves. Uh, it was a slaveocracy. Exactly. Um, so the, 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 the disparity in fighting age, white men who could fight is four to one, but you're saying it's four to four squared, which is basically- Fighting yeah. force, fighting yeah. Uh, numbers. Yeah, 16 to one. Yeah. So let's now move that then to what's going on with Russia, Ukraine. Yeah. And I suppose we could also talk about historically Vietnam, China, you know, there have yeah. been, or, or Finland, Russia, there have been many wars where you have a massive power which can't defeat a far smaller That's one. Right. So, so what explains, is that only, does that prediction only hold under the conditions of say, total war and mass mobilization? What, what explains that? So it's, um, this uh, uh, calculation does not uh, include the, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, degree of resolution for fighting. So United States, for example, won the Vietnam War. Of course, uh, in, in that um, war, we would have to take the logistics into account. It was much more difficult for the United States to supply troops and so on and so forth. But still, it was innumerably more powerful. But it was a war of choice for, for the United States. It was a war uh, of survival for Vietnam. Now, in uh, Russia, Ukraine, uh, the situation is similar to the South and North. Uh, the one to four advantage uh, for um, uh, Russia, and uh, and furthermore, uh, Russia has uh, a military uh, industry which has been actually put into high drive. So it really all de de uh, depends on the determination of uh, the Russian uh, leadership and uh, um, and uh, population behind them. And of course, uh, I certainly hope that it will not lead to World War Three because. Of course, NATO can can come in on the Ukrainian side. So, what you're saying is something like resolution is something which is unquantifiable. 
there's some things which are uh, 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 maybe they're quantifiable, but not given the present state of our science. I think that's a great place to leave it on. Somebody's looking at these big patterns through history, through numbers that says right now we still can't quantify certain things. Peter Turchin, the book is amazing. Thank you so much for joining us on Downstream. Thank you very much. Enjoyed our conversation.